Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Monica Harry and I'm the Director of Content and Mapping at SNOMED International and I will be moderating today's session, which is part of our um, SNOMED CT Expo 2020 and the name of this stream is Terminology Leading Practices. Um, please, during the presentation, use the Q&A box to type your questions to the presenter. All the questions, we're going to answer them at the end of the conclusion of the presentation. So I'm now pleased to introduce Julie James of Blue Wave Informatics, who will be presenting Demystifying Dose Forms to Support Description of Medicinal Products. So over to you, Julie. Thank you, Monica. Um, thank you for having me to present. Um, it's a little weird doing it by recording, but I hope you uh, all enjoy it, or at least manage to stay awake through most of it. Um, what I'd like to do in this presentation, um, it, demystifying dose forms, um, we have quite a uh, complex dose form model in SNOMED CT, which is fundamental to how we describe medicinal products. Um, and I'd like to look at that and compare it to other models out there, particularly the EDQM model, and then talk a little bit about um, some of the areas that you need to consider uh, when you're using this model and the dose forms that it describes in, in the various um, applications, and particularly when mapping to uh, national extension medicinal products. There are four learning objectives <laughs> within this, uh, trying to explain why these dose forms are important, the different types there are, and um, how to manage them in if you've got a, a national medicinal product dictionary or if your dictionary is an extension to SNOMED CT and how you might use them in mapping or directly. So let's make a start. Exactly what is a dose form? Well, dose forms generally are something that pharmacist geeks worry about. Um, they come from a core part of pharmaceutical science called pharmaceutics, which is the science of formulation, or if you like, the design of dose forms. It's the construction of the thing that holds the therapeutic substance or substances inside it so that we can administer it to a patient uh, safely and effectively. Um, having a pile of white powder on the desk is not great for administration to a patient. Um, unless it's cocaine, I suppose. Um, an, an example would be when we formulate something as a sublingual tablet, other than um, as a, a, an oral tablet, if it's sublingual, it's going to bypass the, the liver metabolism and the oral absorption. Um, so it's, um, it, it bypasses all that first past mechanism that would reduce the dose considerably. Uh, and so a sublingual tablet needs to be much more quickly soluble and tasteful than an oral tablet, which hopefully you can swallow whole. But I have to say that the science of pharmaceutics um, isn't necessarily the most exciting. Um, I remember when I was in a lecture and the equation, which was about how uh, particles um, fall down in an emulsion, the equation was so long, it covered the entire blackboard, which tells you how old I am, and it covered an entire page of my notebook. But right at the end, you could see where I completely fell asleep. So it is, I talked about demystifying it, but I'm afraid it is a bit of a geek topic. The other thing that makes it slightly a geek topic is that it's very controlled by pharmaceutical standards. These are the, the authoritative reference standards that, that govern how medicines are produced. Um, and they have been around for a long time, as you can see from, from that elderly textbook. But they are important. They govern and guarantee consistency, safety, and efficacy. So, you know, plain old oral tablet, it will have a standard which says how fast it must dissolve um, at 37 degrees C in pH 1, which is roughly equivalent to stomach acid. It'll also talk about um, how quickly uh, or otherwise it will degrade in a storage container. And that sort of thing is actually tested. Uh, when I was 
uh, in practice, the inspector used to come round and take ten tablets off my off the shelf in uh, in our pharmacy, and take them away to test that they hadn't degraded more than they ought to have done. So we have various formal definitions of dose forms. There are three that matter to us, particularly in clinical care, when we're talking about the pharmaceutical dose form, the physical manifestation of the medicinal product that contains the active substances. And it's the pharmaceutical dose form that we're most concerned about in SNOMED CT. But there are two subtypes of that. There's the administrable dose form and the manufactured dose form. And that's because not all dose forms are directly administrable. A powder for solution for infusion has to be made up to become a solution for infusion before it can actually be given to the patient. So the administrable dose form is the one that can be given to the, the patient. The manufactured dose form is the one that we find when we take the product off the shelf. And it's all about managing the chemistry of the product safely and effectively when we administer it to the patient. There are another set of formal definitions which might not seem quite so relevant to us in patient care, but actually do affect how the terminology works out. The first of those is combined pharmaceutical dose form, which is where two dose forms are put together. And uh, the definition you're seeing here is a very IDMP specific one. And an example of that would be powder and solvent for solution for injection. You can see there's powder and solvent for solution for injection. And the solution for the injection is the bit we're really interested in when we talk about dose forms. Then we get combined term, which at first glance doesn't appear to have anything about dose forms. But when we actually look at it, it's where a dose form is put together with a unit of presentation or an item of packaging solution for injection in a pre-filled syringe. And I'm sure in national extensions, you've got a lot of things like that because clinically, a prescriber may well want to know that something is in a pre-filled syringe because that's going to mean it's um, going to be useful uh, for the patient to administer at home. You don't have to be in a, a clinic or a hospital to administer that. And finally, combination pack. And this is where, in order to get a single therapeutic treatment, we actually give two products and therefore two dose forms. Uh, the classic is treatment of thrush, where you have a, a cream and a pessary. But there are also cases where they, another example here is extra effervescent granules with a film coated tablet. So those second two don't appear to say anything about dose form, but when you look at the, 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 the terms, the concepts that are within them, they do contain dose form terms. So what I've done here, which is something that I did for myself, um, was to draw how these terms relate. You can see combined term out here on the right, the manufactured dose form term and the administrable dose form term both being children of the pharmaceutical dose form. The combined dose form, which may contain either, um, which is likely to contain more than one manufactured dose form and may well produce uh, an administrable dose form. If you think powder for solution, powder and solvent for solution for injection will produce the administrable dose form of solution for injection. And then combination pack, which will contain two or more uh, pharmaceutical dose forms. So I, I built this for myself, but I've, I've shared it with a couple of people and they've said it's been helpful, helpful to understand how these different things relate together. So I, I've put it there. You won't find it in any formal documentation. And here's an example of how that works out. I've got that combined term of solution for injection for pre-filled syringe. And you can see that it's manufactured dose form is solution for injection. And the unit of presentation is pre-filled syringe. And then uh, there's going up from the manufactured dose form, there's the different attributes in the pharmaceutical dose form model, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. 
and what we need when we're defining a clinical drug concept, which is the lowest level in the international drug model, um, is the pharmaceutical dose form. So if you've got a combined term, you might need to decompose it to get the pharmaceutical dose form if you're going to try and do some auto magic mapping to clinical drug. So why are these blessed dose forms so important? Um, why do we need to understand a bit about this geeky formulation science to be able to use them well? It's, as I said when I def define them, it's the thing that contains the pharmaceutical substance or substances. And therefore, a dose form is one of the definitional attributes of the clinical drug in the SNOMED model. It's also, if we're thinking um, more widely, one of the definitional attributes of the manufactured item in IDMP. So, knowing that they're one of the definitional attributes, we know that we might be able to use them in all sorts of ways when mapping. But also, if any of you were at the um, expo last year when I, um, in, in conjunction with the Irish Pharmaceutical Union, did some slides about actual mapping of clinical drugs to SNOMED Core, you'll know that dose forms was one of the major areas of mismatch. And as several people who were at that presentation confirmed that for them, that was also an area that was causing them a lot of mismatches, which is, to be honest, why I, I have looked at them more deeply and come up with this presentation and to see whether we can do anything about um, demystifying and making those mismatches less of a problem. We have a dose form model in SNOMED CT. It's in the qualifier hierarchy, and it means that most of our pharmaceutical dose forms are fully modeled concepts. The five definitional attributes of pharmaceutical dose form are populated, again, with values from the qualifier hierarchy. But unfortunately, we also do have a, um, a few primitives. Oh, sorry, I've, I've uh, jumped ahead of myself. Here's an example of a fully specified dose form, conventional release sublingual tablet, um, which in the preferred term would be actually sublingual tablet. And all the five attributes are filled in uh, and we get a fully specified concept. But as I say, some of them are still primitive. And a lot of these actually are, are, are in the um, respiratory dose forms. But they're still really, really useful concepts you know, we need to be able to say conventional release aerosol solution for inhalation. So they're, they're in there, but as sibling primitive concepts. So that was the dose form model. This is the EDQM model, which is used um, by a lot of the reg regulatory agencies in Europe. But actually, also, it's, it's a model that a lot of other regulatory agencies like the FDA are, are looking at and thinking about. And I mention this because so much of our raw data about medicinal products is coming from our regulatory agencies. It's our primary source um, for all of us. So knowing how that relates to what we're going to find in SNOMED CT is really important. And it helps us to understand, I hope, some of the challenges that we find when we're mapping. So there's that um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical dose form model in EDQM. And um, it looks a bit familiar, doesn't it? We lay it out differently in SNOMED CT, but the attributes, the release characteristics, the intended site, the administration method, they're, they're very, very similar. So we should be very much dealing with the same things, but we are still finding mismatches. And that's what I hope to uh, demystify a little bit more as we go through. So looking at the models directly and trying to demystify them, they, we're looking at the same concept, the dose form of the medicine. But because we're in the different domains, they have slightly different out outworkings. SNOMED CT is using description logic with the classifier working to build the concept and the relationships, and those relationships are definitional. 
EDQM has a model that is implemented in a database, but only its text is definitional. There is no sense that the attributes and relationships that it has are definitional. And that's really important to remember. There will be things that have exactly the same patterns of attributes in EDQM, uh, and you need to look at the text to disambiguate them. So, as I say, this is absolutely critical for EDQM, and um, this is a screenshot from their from their browser, and it will show you that you know we have the same uh, monograph. And I said right at the beginning. Uh, those forms are subject to mono a pharmaceutical and pharmacopoeial monograph standards. We have the things that say share the same monograph, but actually have different uh, pharmaceutical dose forms. And you need to read the text to find out what those differences are so that you can map them accurately. And sometimes, I'm afraid to say, those attributes can be confusing. Um, I was very surprised to find that uh, some attributes, some, particularly for the transformation, uh, a dose form can have three different uh, types of transformation and no transformation. Um, so we won't go into the discussion of when the negation indicator does or doesn't come in for there. And to be fair, SNOMED CT just opts it for no transformation. But you know, we all know that oral powder, you can just put it on a spoon and swallow it. You can mix it in some jam, which would count as dispersion, and, and get someone to swallow it. Or you, you could um, put it in a, um, a cup of water and stir it up and hope that it dissolves. And that would be the dissolution uh, transformation. So it's um, it's not always as straightforward as maybe we would like when you're looking at EDQM dose forms. And those are the dose forms that you will find in your regulatory information. So just to reiterate, there are challenges. And those challenges are very um, acute when we come to mapping. So how are we going to solve them? Well, it's really important to know why you're mapping, because knowing why you're mapping will give you um, some pointers to what sort of decisions you make when there are choices, and there will be choices. So I want to look at how the de demystifying our, our dose forms can help us in our mapping. We need to know what you're mapping for, what are your use cases, and how will your use cases um, affect the granularity of the dose form description that you need for your business requirements? And are there going to be any language um, requirements that you need to consider? And what are you mapping between? What types of dose forms are you mapping to and from? Are you mapping from authori authorized dose forms to pharmaceutical dose forms? Are you mapping manufactured dose forms or administrable dose forms? Answering those questions in the light of your use cases will also help to demystify. So, which use cases are we dealing with? In the international core for medicinal products, we document um, several use cases that are the main ones that you might like to consider. So, you know, if you have an existing national medicinal product terminology, do you need to map? Or will you be um, using the international core to develop from? And in either case, mapping is likely to be involved somewhere. If you're looking for compatibility with the IDMP model, possibly because you want to stream data directly from your re regulatory agency into an existing MPD or into one that you'll build as a national extension, um, this is a really important area to consider what IDMP is doing in terms of dose forms. And we've talked a little bit about the EDQM model. 
um, if you're looking to do international interoperability of medication concepts, then that's going to be a key use case, particularly in Europe. I know we're not traveling at the moment, and sadly, we're not in Portugal. We would love to be. Uh, but that in international interoperability, either for things like patient summaries or even for cross-border care and uh, dispensing of prescriptions written in one country and given to another, then this is really important to know what level of mapping we might use. Are you going to be doing decision support and will you want to facilitate that from other providers? Um, are you going to use a classifier if you're building a national extension? It's obviously not a given that you will be doing this. Many national extensions are built using much um, simpler database te um, te technology. Only a very few seem to be give, built at the moment using the classifier. Uh, but it's a consideration that you might want to take into account. Are you going to be doing analysis of medication information? in your healthcare data? And very particularly, are you going to be using medication concepts elsewhere, particularly ones for, uh, that will tie back to SNOMED CT? If you're going to be using SNOMED CT concepts for your allergy checking and using recording those in your EHR, then tying back to the international core of um, medication concepts may be particularly important and you want your dose forms to support that. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. Concept granularity. We said uh, early on that con dose forms are about pharmaceutics, about managing the chemistry of our active ingredients safely and effectively as we administer them to a patient. So whether something is a solution, a suspension, or an emulsion, is really important in pharmaceutics. So then when we get our dose forms, goodness me, we get all these different choices when something is a solution, a suspension, or emulsion. And that's really fine for parenteral products. If we've got a patient in the intensive care unit, which used to be my speciality of area of practice, um, where I've got maybe 10, 12, 15 different parenteral medications to give a patient, and I've only got three lines to give them in, and they're all infusions, I've got to understand the chemistry and the pharmaceutics, because I absolutely, if one of my medications is an emulsion, I cannot mix it with anything else, it'll split, and I'll get embolisms and I will then get a very poor, poorly patient. So the level of granularity that we describe parenteral products in is, is going to need the full granularity of the dose form model. But if I'm going to in, describe eye drops, there's clinically very few reasons why I might want to know whether something is an emulsion, a suspension, or a solution. The pharmacopoeial standards for all eye drops insist that they are safe, that they have no microbial or particulate con um, contamination, and that their pH is going to give you a reasonably comfortable administration. And anyone who's had to administer chloramphenicol will know that that's only reasonably comfortable. So I maybe don't need all that granularity. I might want something far less granular that just says, conventional release eye drops, whose preferred term would just be eye drops. Um, and, and that will do me fine. So I might want to use a different level of, um, of dose form description in the SNOMED um, hierarchy to map to, to allow my concepts to be automatically mapped. Do watch out though. With the dose form hierarchy is an open world hierarchy. So you'll notice that a child of conventional release dose forms is also the eye and ear drop dose forms. So although the group of concepts might be useful, uh, there are some things there that you, you might want to watch out for explicitly if you've got products that are that have their dose form described as um, eye or ear drops, you'll want to manage that map slightly differently. 
Um, just a note there that EDQM has patient-friendly terms. And uh, although you can't get those out of the database automatically, they are there. And their links might be useful to, to help with that sort of, that sort of automatic mapping. Another area where the granularity of what is needed for patient care and therefore um, more SNOMED-like um, dose form descriptions is in oral solutions and oral solution, oral drops solutions. And knowing when you've got those terms in the uh, dose forms that you're mapping from can be very useful to know whether you want to map them to a group group a concept as just oral solution or whether you want to keep the very granular oral drops solution and understanding why those different dose form terms exist can be very useful um, it's usually about whether a project has a five mil strength or gives it strength as a per mil um, but it's not always the case, and you would need to check within your local area, your local jurisdiction, what the rules are for um, describing strengths. But note that in SNOMED core, all oral liquids will have their strengths as a concentration strength. So even if in your national extension you've got um, a 5 mil strength, it would have to map in the core to a per mil strength. Another area, and one that um, on a different call today, I heard the FDA discussing capsule soft versus capsule hard, which appears to be very important in Europe, but not in the least bit important in the US. Um, and very likely to not be um, important in patient care and just oral capsule may be uh, more, in, more useful. So you might want to do a two to one mapping if um, you find that in your, your mapping data, you've got these very granular terms. An area as an English speaker, I had not realized, but um, in the last year or so, I've been working more in France and trying to get my pharmaceutical French better. And I discovered that um, sometimes there are real language translation issues. Um, if you look at sealant powder and powder for sealant, these are two different PDFs, pharmaceutical dose forms. They have very different, uh, quite different definitions and a note that says, please don't confuse them. But you'll notice in French, they are actually the same t term, that, that the language that can be used to express them is the same. So if you're mapping from your own national language, you might want to check where what you think is one term might actually come out as two terms uh, in a very precise pharmaceutical dose form, both in uh, EDQM and in SNOMED CT. And if you've done a lot of mapping in other clinical areas, I'm sure you will be more than familiar with those issues, but you will also find them in this uh, very uh, controlled world of pharmaceutical terms as well. So uh, moving forward, know what you are mapping between. I've said uh, two or three times, regulatory information is obviously our, is often our starting place. And we know that IDMP is helping to standif standardize this. And it's also helpfully de hopefully demystifying some of it also. But when we come to dose forms, that can offer some challenges in what is provided and what is needed in patient care and when it comes to uh, mapping to SNOMED CT. We have authorized dose forms versus pharmaceutical dose forms and manufactured dose forms versus, versus administrable dose forms. We, we talked a little bit about the manufactured dose form and authorized dose form earlier. But um, this was, this authorized dose form was something that, um, even though I've been working with dose forms for 15 years, uh, I only tripped up really quite recently, in recent years. Um, 
even in our national extensions and our national MPDs, our main source of information is uh, a summary of product characteristics or in the dose, uh, in the North America, the product label. And um, you will see in that something that is the authorized dose form. Um, it's often labeled as the pharmaceutical form. Or, and it may not be labeled as the pharmaceutical dose form, but it's actually the authorized dose form. And knowing how this relates to what we want as the attribute that supports the clinical drug, the pharmaceutical dose form, um, if we want to do some um, auto magic extraction, uh, can be very helpful. Um, going back to that diagram that I do, drew for myself, um, the authorized dose form, the thing that is put into the uh, product label or the SMPC, can draw its value set from four different places, not just pharmaceutical dose form. An authorized dose form might be a combined term, a pharmaceutical dose form, or a combined pack, a combination pack. So, no, understanding that the authorized dose form that you think is going to be just a dose form might actually not be just a dose form uh, can be quite helpful. And knowing how they relate to together and being able to, dis uh, to take them apart might be very helpful. So um, this is an example with the combined term, which we looked at very early on in the, in the examples. Um, Fred's Pharmaceuticals this is, uh, has manufactured a solution for injection in five mil vials. Very simply, our clinical drug will be exotacillin five milligram per one mil solution for injection, a very simple dose form, solution for injection. And uh, with any luck, that's exactly what we would get in the product label or the SMPC for that product. However, a couple of years later, Fred's also decided to market a solution for injection in a pre-filled syringe. We think, hold on a minute, that's still a solution for injection. The pharmaceutical dose form is exactly the same. But in the regulatory world, for all sorts of reasons, that if you uh, look up the, all the text of that, which sadly I have, those dose forms are different. And the actual dose form for this second product that Fred's going to license will be the combined term, uh, solution for injection in, in pre-filled syringe. So if you, it might help to do the deconstruction before you map because it's still going to map to the SNOMED CT exocetylin 5 milligram per 1 mil solution for injection. That clinical drug hasn't changed, but the dose forms that will map to it uh, from your national extension uh, will be different. And if you deconstruct the combined term, it would, will also give you uh, the unit of presentation, which you need if you're going to use a, a clinical drug presentation um, subset and the attribute there for the unit of presentation. So doing that deconstruction before you do your mapping uh, might be very helpful. And moving quickly on, because I've just spotted the time, um, the administrable and the manufactured dose forms are also an issue. In SNOMED CT, we primarily use the manufactured dose form. But very occasionally, we will use the administrable dose form. And the classic for this is all the um, oral antibiotic liquids, which have to be made up before they're administered to the patient. Um, they all will have a manufactured dose form as conventional release powder for, solution for, in, uh, powder for oral solution. But actually, we'll, we'll put them as CDs as oral solution because we give the strength as the, the per mil strength. And obviously, a powder won't have a per mil strength, where a liquid will. Um, and so, we've, in a sense, pre done the transform from manufactured 
to administrable dose form so that we can give a strength that is clinically recognizable in SNOMED CT. So that's where we, we use the, the, the per mil strength. Um, and I'm hoping you'll be able to download these slides and look at the detail of them if this is an area that you're going to be mapping from directly. So in summary, I hope this has provided some insight into why dose forms are so important when we're describing a dis medicinal products and the different types that we get. We, when we all start out, we think, oh, dose form, it's one thing. But maybe now you realize that actually there are many different types and understanding how they uh, relate together will help with the mapping. Um, the different models that are out there, the definitional and the descriptive, and the importance of reading text if you find you're, using, you're mapping from descriptive dose forms to SNOMED CT, and how to um, know what will come from uh, regulatory information and how you can map it to what will be used nationally for your own patient care use cases. And I trust that if you've managed to follow all of that, and I did say at the beginning this was a little bit geeky, and I do apologize, um, the challenges are overcomable with understanding and mapping policy and good examples. I've thrown in a very few examples here. There are lots and lots more. And if you can get good tooling support for that, that should uh, really be able to help. And as Monica said at the beginning, questions are very, very welcome. And if not now, uh, please do feel free to contact me. I am a sad bunny. I really do enjoy this stuff. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Julie, for your presentation. Can I ask that attendees give us a few moments while we switch from our pre-recorded content so that uh, Julie can then address the questions that you've been submitting? Um, just also a note to say that this presentation will be available on the event platform for the next um, three months. So thank you so much for attending. And um, thank you, Julie. That was a wonderful presentation. Lots of detail there. There are a couple of questions. Um, I will read the first one out to you. Um, have you come across any dose forms available in EDQM but not in SNOMED? If you do, how would you map the dose form? How would you decide, well, it's in several parts. How would you decide which dose forms are the same if the dose forms have a different naming in EDQM versus SNOMED? Um, thank you. That's quite a complex question, and I'm very conscious that we have a very short amount of time. Uh, first answer, yes, I have. There are definitely things in EDQM that are not in SNOMED. Um, and my first consideration would be, are they truly pharmaceutical dose forms? Because there are some things I think in EDQM that are not, um, and that's a separate discussion. When you come to looking at things when it's related not just to the dose form, but to a dose form for a particular medicine like Creon, you do actually sometimes have to go back to the raw data for the medicine, because particularly if it's an, um, a classic medicine, um, the dose form name that was given might not have been as granular or, or as detailed as we have now. Um, and there's always going to be the odd 5% that you have to work at very directly like that. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, I'll move on just because I won't answer. There's bits more to that question. Maybe an email could be sent to me and I can send that along to Julie and back and forth. What has your experience been with handling brand names and clinical variations between their source substance and potentially differing clinical uses? Um, that's a very different topic. That's around uh, sub therapeutic substances as opposed to dose forms. Um, extensive uh, what is my experience it's quite extensive and um that whole topic about um what is the pharmacology what is the therapeutics and what is the licensed indication for medication it would be the subject of a whole nother presentation i'm afraid okay uh there's also a question that came in that i will answer the question was are we planning to cover essential medicines list as published by the who 
Um, we're approximately 48 to 50 percent coverage at the moment. We've been discussing internally next steps, but at this time, um, it's not a priority just because we have a limited resources and competing priorities. But it's something we're definitely looking at, considering, and may well progress in the future. Still a few minutes if you have any other questions. And if not, thanks to everybody who attended and feel free to reach out if you do still have questions. And thanks so much, Julie, that was an excellent, very uh, detailed presentation. It was really helpful, thank you.